Chapter 4 Ice Ice, Terry thought. He felt frozen to the spot, chilled through. He felt as if he'd turned to ice. And then he felt hot, hot with anger. I can't believe someone would do such a cruel thing, he said finally. Nikki didn't answer. She just stood there, obviously upset. There's only one person mean enough to do this, said Terry, and you know who it is as well as I do. Don't start anything, Terry, please, said Nikki. I haven't started anything, but I'm ready to finish something, said Terry heatedly. Alex is behind this. It can only be Alex. Terry, no, please don't, Nikki clutched his arm. It wasn't Alex. Alex likes me. You're wrong. You're not thinking clearly. Listen, Nikki, I know that you don't know who it was. If you say anything to Alex, it would only make things worse. Yeah, but why can't I just... Please, Nikki repeated. Let's just forget it. Forget it? Terry was shocked that she could even suggest such a thing. It's... it's just a joke, she said. It's mean and stupid, but that's all it is. If we pretend it never happened, whoever it did won't get any satisfaction. Terry could see that she was probably right, but he didn't like it. Just not mention it. Right, said Nikki, and not act upset. That's going to take an Academy Award-winning performance, said Terry. Please, Terry, for me, she said. He looked down at her and felt himself melting. At times like this, he knew that Nikki was the most important person in his life, and he would do anything for her. Okay, funny face, he said. For you. She stood on her tiptoes and kissed him on the cheek. Thanks. In fact, Terry said, I have an idea. Let's walk home by way of Pete's Pizza. We can practice our Academy Award performances over Cokes. Nikki smiled again, a genuine loving smile. You're on, she said. Pete's Pizza was one of Shadyside's most popular teen hangouts, and that day it was jammed, both with kids from Shadyside and from the nearby junior college. Terry and Nikki were lucky to find a tiny booth vacant. While they waited for their orders, Terry started telling Nikki about his biology project. It was so noisy in Pete's that he could barely hear anything she said, but she picked up everything he was telling her. He had just gotten to the part about how the seed splits into two when Nikki interrupted him. Terry, look, she said, pointing. He followed the direction of her finger and saw Justine standing in a phone booth, a serious look on her face. Maybe we ought to ask her to join us, Terry said. She told me she wants to get to know you better. Okay, said Nikki. We'll just keep an eye on her, and... She stopped speaking, and a strange expression came over her face. Terry took her hand. What's wrong, Nikki? What is it? Maybe nothing, said Nikki, but look at Justine. Terry turned to the phone booth again. Justine was still talking into the phone with an odd, intense look. It was as if she'd changed into a different person, older and cruel. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, Nikki said, but I read her lips, and she said, They'll pay. Every one of them will pay. Chapter 5 Halloween Night The wind picked up, gusting wildly through the old cemetery, shaking the bare tree limbs like the bony fingers of skeletons. Nikki squeezed Terry's hand as they approached the Cameron mansion. They were following Murphy, who was still chuckling over the scare he'd given them. Suddenly, Nikki wheeled around. Two other kids were making their way through the cemetery, their costumes glowing in the pale, silvery October moonlight. Everyone had been given directions to come the same way. They all had to park in a cul-de-sac at the end of Fear Street and cut through the cemetery to Justine's house at the edge of the woods. In spite of the scare Murphy had given him and Nikki, Terry decided that going through the cemetery had been a great idea. What could be better for putting everyone in a Thrills and Shills Halloween mood? Up close, the Cameron Mansion looked even spookier than it had from the cemetery. It was surrounded on both sides by barren trees that looked as if they had been hundreds of years old. The ground floor windows were covered with heavy iron grates, and beside them the battered wooden shutters banged in the wind. They may be fixing this old house up, thought Terry, but it still resembles something out of a horror movie. Maybe it really is haunted. Just then, there was a break in the wind, and he could hear music and shrieks of laughter from inside. It sounded as if the party had already started. Murphy was clomping up the front steps of the porch, his zombie costume fluttering around him in the wind. Terry sneaked a quick glance at Nikki and squeezed her hand reassuringly. She was dressed as an old-fashioned carnival reveler, in a beautiful red satin ball gown and flowing black cape. She had copied the dress from a book of old party costumes. She was beautiful. Grinning at Terry excitedly, she slid on her shiny black feathered eye mask. Quickly, Terry pulled on his own mask. His mother had helped him dress up as a greaser from the 1950s. He was wearing black chino pants and old saddle shoes of his father's that he'd found in the attic. He had rolled a pack of cigarettes in one of the sleeves of his tight white t-shirt and had a loose dark jacket over it. His hair was slicked back on the sides with Vaseline and teased up in the front. When he had left the house that evening, he thought he looked pretty cool, but now he wondered if he just looked silly. Like a wimp. As if reading his thoughts, Nikki reached up and kissed him on the cheek. You look great, Terry, she said. Terry smiled down at her. So do you, funny face. He slid up his mask and leaned over to kiss her. She kissed him back, and for a moment they just stood there, holding each other awkwardly because of their costumes, and kissing. Ah, uh, Terry, Nikki said after a moment, what about the party? What party, said Terry. 
but he pulled away and smiled down at her again. Then, hand in hand, they mounted the steps up to the vine-choked porch. Murphy must have already gone inside, because the porch was empty. There was a heavy, ornate door knocker in the shape of a skull in the center of the old wooden door. Terry reached out to pull it when suddenly a huge hairy spider swooped through the air and landed on his arm. No! Nicky shrieked, and Terry jumped back, his heart pounding. Got you again! Terry spun around and saw Murphy standing on the railing on the side of the porch, hidden by some of the vines. Cackling maniacally, Murphy jumped onto the porch. The giant rubber bug was on the end of a long pole and rubber band that he jerked up and down like a yo-yo. Murphy laughed. You two sure scare easy. If all the wimps are as wimpy as you, the jocks will win this contest easy. Very funny, Murph, said Terry. He took a deep breath and then laughed. Adjusting his mask, he raised his hand to knock again. There was a creaking noise and the door slowly swung open. Justine's living room was an eerie wonder, the ultimate fantasy of the ultimate Halloween dream, or nightmare. Artificial cobwebs hung in every corner, and cutouts of skeletons, witches, and bats dipped and swooped from the ceiling. Along a narrow balcony, above one side of the living room, were colored spotlights that seemed to sweep the room in time to the music, their flickering lights causing everything to move eerily. The only other light came from the huge open fireplace, where a big black kettle was boiling, sending greenish fumes bubbling up. All the furniture was from another century with the music booming from hidden speakers, was now. The whole effect was like the world's most modern haunted castle. Even Murphy was impressed. Wow, he said, stopping just inside the living room door. I mean, wow. Oh, Terry, it's excellent. Nicky gripped his arm in excitement. They stood in the open door for a moment as an apparition of beauty, or evil, crossed the room. It took Terry a moment to recognize Justine. She was dressed all in black in a body-hugging, low-cut satin gown and high-spiked sandals. Her thick blonde hair was piled high on her head, and she had powdered her face and throat so they were dead white, except for the slash of red on her full lips and the glittering green irises of her eyes. She looks like that dark-haired woman on TV with the horror movies. Elvira, Terry whispered. Justine paused for effect, then smiled warmly. Welcome to my crypt, she said. Almost everyone else is here. We're beginning to think the ghouls got you. Great costume, Justine, said Nikki. Thanks, said Justine. I always wanted to be a vampire. She said it as if she meant it, then laughed. Your costume's pretty cool, too. It reminds me of one I saw at the Venice Carnival. The what? said Nikki. A big party they hold in Venice once a year, said Justine. Everyone dresses up in parties through the streets and canals. That's Venice, Italy, she added. I used to live there with my, my uncle, which reminds me. Uncle Philip, I'd like you to meet my new friends. A very skinny man stepped out of the shadows beside the fireplace. He was wearing a blue satin clown costume, and his face was covered with grease paint in a sad clown mask. A single sparkling tear was glued below his right eye. This is Murphy Carter, Nicky Mayer, and Terry Ryan, Justine said. I'm very pleased to meet all of you, said Philip, studying each one carefully with his sad clown eyes. We're very pleased to meet you, said Terry, shaking Philip's hand. Your place is terrific. Yes, agreed Nicky. This is the most incredible party I've ever been to. Why, thank you, said Philip. We had an engineer from Starflight Disco install the lights and sound system. Justine picked out all the tapes and CDs. We, my niece and I, have done all we could to make sure this party is one you will never forget. Let me take your coat, said Justine. Come on in and join the fun. There's food over there on top of the casket and soda chilling in that kettle. Justine and her uncle left to talk to the other guests. Terry remained by the door, checking out the fantastic decor. A couple of kids were dancing by the fireplace, and a few more were standing and eating and laughing. With all the decorations, the place looked like a movie set. Justine and her uncle must have a lot of money, Terry thought. This party cost plenty. I wonder why she wanted to spend so much on just nine people. Pretty weird, huh? said Nikki at his side. Weird? Are you kidding? It's great, exclaimed Terry. They spent a lot of money on this party, Nikki went on as if she had been reading his thoughts. I wonder why she went to all this trouble. Beats me, said Terry. Maybe we're her favorite charity. Lucky us, yeah, said Nikki. Still, I'd like to know more about Justine. Terry laughed. Nicky was the most naturally curious person he'd ever known. Hey, funny face, he said. You can play Nancy Drew later. For now, let's check out the refreshments. He took her hand and led her to the side of the room. As Justine had said, the refreshment table was a shiny black coffin. It was covered with an appetizing array of cheese, bread, crackers, and various dips and hors d'oeuvres, including several Terry had never seen before. A shelf above the coffin held huge bowls of chips and platters of pizza pepperoni, onion, sausage, and every combination Terry had ever heard of. Below, all the food was a huge black cauldron packed with ice and dozens of cans of soda. Look at this, Terry said. I've never seen so much food at a party. Me neither, Nikki agreed. Except maybe when my parents had their New Year's party. 
She reached for a cracker covered with something pink. Yummy, she said. I wonder what it is. Tamara Salata, said Angela, who suddenly appeared beside her. She touched Nikki's shoulder and repeated the words so Nikki could read her lips. It's a Greek dish made out of fish eggs. I asked Justine. She said she learned how to make it when she lived in the Greek islands. It's good, said Nikki thoughtfully. Try some, Terry. Fish eggs, he said. Thanks anyway. I'll stick with pizza. He stepped back and eyed Angela's costume appreciatively. She was dressed like a biker girl, all in leather, and had stenciled tattoos on her arms and neck. Neat costume, he said. Thanks, said Angela. You should see some of the others. This is definitely the most excellent party I've ever been to. While Nikki sampled something green with white swirls in it, Terry munched on pizza and surveyed the rest of the party. It was a little hard to see with all the shadows, but he could make out Trisha and David talking in a corner underneath a human skull. David was wearing his basketball uniform, only instead of a basketball, he was holding a big, round, papier-mâché skull. Trisha, her round face cheery and excited, was wearing a cheerleader's outfit from the 50s, with a tight pink sweater and short white skirt over white ankle-length boots. She had a big megaphone in her hand and would have looked ridiculous, except she was obviously having such a good time. In front of the fireplace, Justine was dancing with Murphy, the vampire and the zombie. They looked gross, but also fascinating, like creatures out of a horror movie. Terry was just wondering where the last couple of kids were when he heard a strange noise behind him. He turned and gawked, then started laughing. He couldn't help himself. It was Ricky Shore, dressed as a frog. He was wearing bright green long underwear, a pair of swim fins, and a half mask on top of his head with bulging green eyes. Ribbit, he said. I don't believe this, Terry finally said when he could breathe again. You came as your biology project. You like it, said Ricky, taking a swig of dyed Dr. Pepper. I dyed the underwear myself. My mom got kind of upset, though. She couldn't get all the color out of her washing machine. I think that's the real you, said Angela nastily. Sort of slimy and nerdy. Oh yeah, said Ricky. That shows all you know. If you kiss me, I'll turn into a prince. I'll take my chances with the zombie, thanks, said Angela. Murphy and Justine had stopped dancing, and Angela walked over and took Murphy's hand. Hey, funny face, said Terry, touching Nikki on the arm. You can stop eating for a couple of minutes. Want to dance? A fast, hard rap song was on, and Nikki closed her eyes for a moment to better sense the beat of the music, coming through the vibrations in the floor. Sure, she said. I better stop eating anyway. Terry, this is the most fabulous food. She's got things here from Greece, Japan, France, Mexico. Not to mention good old American pizza, said Terry. Don't be a dweeb, said Nikki. She twirled away from him, then came back. There's one thing I can't figure out, she said. I don't see how Justine could possibly have lived in all those places. I mean, she's just a senior. Ask her later, said Terry. Another song started, and they kept dancing. He watched Nikki proudly. Nikki was the prettiest girl there. Justine was too ghoulish, and Angela looked like a tramp. But Nikki's red dress brought out the vibrant color in her cheeks and lips and made her dark eyes glow like coals. To one side, Ricky and Trisha danced. The billowous green frog and the plump cheerleader, both of them having a great time. This is a cool party, Terry told himself. I still don't know why we were invited, but I'm glad. The tape clicked off. While Philip went to change it, there was a sound of heavy knocking at the front door. Justine went to answer it, and everyone turned to see the late arrival. For a moment, there was total silence. Standing in the living room doorway, framed against the dark hallway, was a figure dressed in shining silver from head to toe. He struck a pose like a matador, then strode into the living room. Now Terry could see that it was Alex, dressed in a skin-tight silver bodysuit and a glittering silver mask. Beneath the silver, his muscles rippled as he moved. What a show-off, Terry thought. Nikki gripped Terry's hand tighter, and she whispered, Wow, he looks fantastic. Several of the other guests began to whistle and shout. Even Justine couldn't take her eyes off Alex. Ladies and gentlemen, she said at last, I give you the silver prince. Alex came the rest of the way into the living room, as if he owned it. Terry couldn't resist saying something. Nikki's exclamation of how fantastic Alex looked had set him off. Hey, Alex, he called. What are you supposed to be? The Tin Woodsman? Or is it Tinkerbell? Alex laughed. Admit it, Ryan, he said. You can never look this good in a million years. Terry was still trying to think of a sarcastic reply when the music started up again, and for a moment, Alex danced by himself, the complete center of attention. Nikki tugged at Terry's arm. Come on, Terry, she said. Let's dance. She gave him such a loving look that for a moment, Terry forgot to envy Alex's spectacular costume. Take that, Silver Prince, he thought. Show off all you want, but Nikki wants to dance with me. Even though she couldn't hear the sounds of the music, Nikki was one of the best dancers Terry had ever known. She once explained to him how she felt the beat through her body, but he still wasn't sure how she did it. All he knew was that he liked it. He felt as if he could dance like that forever, holding Nikki close to him, the warmth of her body against his. The slow song ended and another started up, just as slow and romantic. Terry brushed Nikki's hair with his lips, inhaling her spicy fragrance. Baroom! 
The noise was as loud as a thunderclap. What was that? Someone yelled. Everyone was startled. The tape switched off. Hey, what's going on? In the next instant, the room filled with smoke. Then the room filled with frightened cries, confused whispers. No one was sure if it was a trick of some kind, or a catastrophe. Terry was about to pull Nikki toward the door when Justine stepped into the center of the room. Like my surprise, she asked, her sexy body almost disappearing in the smoke. It's what they call a flash pot. My uncle Philip picked it up when he was a stage manager. I wanted to get your attention. Did I succeed? A couple of kids cheered and clapped. A few were still too stunned to react. Justine smiled and raised an eyebrow. I promise you lots of surprises, she said, and there will be more to come. But for now, who's up for more dancing? The cheers and applause grew even louder. Terry found himself cheering too. It seemed that anything could happen at this party, and he was ready for it. Good, said Justine, but first, I should tell you a true story. Throughout history, people have loved to dance, but in the Middle Ages, dancing was sometimes much more than just fun. In fact, some people were said to be taken by evil spirits when they danced. They would dance faster and faster, till they literally danced themselves to death. I don't know if we have any evil spirits here tonight, but anything could happen on Halloween. Is anyone brave enough to try some really fast music? Yeah, let's go! Yo! The crowd was not ready for anything. If Justine had told them all to jump into a swimming pool with their clothes on, Terry thought, they would have done it. We'll see how fast you can go, Justine said. She reached behind her and flicked the switch. The candles on the wall went out. At the same time, a strobe light came on and the music came back on, loud and fast. A relentless, synthesized rhythm over electronic sounding voices repeating, pump up the jam, pump up the jam, over and over. The fire in the fireplace had died down to embers, so the only light came from the strobe, and this rapid flickering, everything seemed to move faster and faster. Terry took Nikki's hands and twirled her. Everyone was laughing, dancing, shouting, and changing partners. In the eerie light, it was hard to see who was dancing with whom. Once, Terry found himself dancing with Ricky. It was fun, but it went on and on. Whenever Terry started to slow down, the music went faster. In the center of the room, Alex was twirling like a shiny silver top, and Terry suddenly wondered where Nikki was. Just when he spotted her dancing with David, the lights went out. The tape player died down with a sad groan. For a moment, there was dead silence. Except for the faint glow from the fireplace, the room was in total darkness. What is this, Justine? Another surprise? asked Murphy's voice after a moment. I don't know what happened, said Justine. She sounded a little frightened. Uncle Philip? I'll check the fuse box, Philip's voice said calmly. Don't go away. Don't worry, everyone, said Justine, still sounding scared. We just had a new electric system installed, and the strobe must have overheated it. My uncle will change the fuses, and we'll... At that moment, the artificial candles came back on, and the tape started up again. But no one felt like dancing anymore, because the light showed a horrifying sight. In front of the fireplace, half on and half off the rug, lay a limp body. Blood trickled down its sides from the huge carving knife sticking out of its back. Chapter 6 For a moment, nobody moved or spoke. Then several people began screaming at once. Terry's heart was beating so fast he could hear it. The vast room seemed to spin, then tilt. He grabbed a chair to steady himself. It took a while for his head to clear. Sounds came back. He could hear individual voices. Oh, oh no! Is it real? Who is it? Somebody, call 911! Tightly holding Nikki's hand, Terry began to move toward the body with the other guests. He could now see that it was someone dressed in a skeleton costume. But who? Everyone seemed reluctant to get any nearer. Finally, Alex squatted down. He tentatively reached out to touch the body when suddenly the skeleton jumped up. Trick or treat! The skeleton yelled and collapsed, laughing uncontrollably back on the rug. It was Les Whittle. There were gasps of surprise, then laughter, nervous at first, built until the room nearly shook from it. One for the wimp's side, shouted Ricky in triumph. Great trick, Les! Terry clapped him on the shoulder. It was good, agreed Trisha in a shaky voice. But you had us all scared to death. Why didn't you tell the rest of the team you were going to do it? Because Justine and I didn't cook it up until just this morning, said Les, still laughing. He showed them all the knife. It was just a knife handle. The blood was the kind that comes in a tube. I found these in a joke shop and thought it would be a shame to waste them, he explained. It was the easiest thing in the world. Yeah, well, for your information, none of us was scared at all, said Murphy. That's just the sort of wimpy trick a wimp would pull. Les wasn't all that perturbed. Sure, Murph. Tell us another one, he said, chuckling. He put his horn-rimmed glasses on over his skeleton mask. It made him appear incongruous, like a studious corpse. I've been hiding in the kitchen for half an hour, he said. Where's the food? I'm starved. Most of the kids, exhausted by dancing in the scare, collapsed on the antique furniture, eating and talking. What a dumb trick, said David, his legs thrown over the arm of an antique rocking chair. 
You're just jealous because you didn't think of it, said Trisha. We've thought of better tricks, David said. Much better. You'll see what I mean, unless you get some sense and go home now. Never, said Ricky. You jocks don't have a chance. You're the ones who don't have a chance, said Alex. But I gotta hand it to Lass. He made a pretty good corpse. Terry didn't say anything. Nicky was sitting, turned away from everyone, eating another plateful of food. He was glad she couldn't hear the conversation, because it would probably just get her mad again. So, what do you think, guy? said Alex jovially, sitting next to Terry and Nicky on the arm of an antique wooden bench. Think your team can go the distance. We've got a better chance than your team, muttered Terry. We have some brains on our side. Alex laughed. He wanted it to sound like a good nature laugh, but Terry knew better. Great costume, Nicky, Alex said, admiring her appreciatively. Thanks, Nicky said. I made it myself. You could always do anything, said Alex. I remember that great dress you made for the freshman dance. You were the best-looking girl there. Well, thanks, said Nicky. Her eyes were sparkling, and Terry forced himself to take a slow, deep breath. He hated himself for feeling jealous, but he couldn't help it. After all, Nicky was sitting next to him, holding his hand, so why did he feel so jealous of Alex? Why did he want to punch him in the face? Say, Nicky, said Alex teasingly. Don't you think it's about time you joined the jock team? Nikki's eyes changed. She was no longer flirtatious, but now sad and a little angry. Oh, will you two stop it with your idiotic games? I said it a hundred times. I'm not on either side. She abruptly stood up and walked toward the fireplace. The dance music had started again, and Terry was surprised to see Nikki ask Ricky to dance. What's with her? Alex asked Terry. I guess she's been hanging out with you for so long, she's forgotten how to take a joke. Hey, Beal, you're the joke, Terry muttered. She just doesn't like the whole contest idea. Hey, man, I thought you were supposed to be such a good talker. You know, debate team and everything. You mean you couldn't talk Nikki into joining your team? Whoa. Nikki makes her own decisions, Terry stood up. I don't own her. Wow, heavy talk, Ryan. Back off, okay? Alex leaned away from Terry and put up his hand as if shielding himself. You and I used to be friends, remember? Used to be, Terry thought. Those were the key words. He realized that Alex was reaching out to him. Alex was deliberately reminding him of what good buddies they had been until very recently. Alex was staring at him expectantly, but Terry couldn't respond. He just had a bad feeling about Alex. He couldn't pretend to want him as a friend again. Alex's eyes filled with disappointment. Later, man, he said abruptly, and got up quickly from the bench. Alex walked toward the glowing fireplace with a swagger. The song on the tape ended. Alex stepped up to Nikki and Ricky and smoothly took Nikki's hand. As if he owns her or something, Terry thought, watching with great discomfort. Trying not to look as if he were watching, Terry kept sneaking glances at Alex and Nikki. They were dancing to a fast number, and Nikki was smiling. Does she have to smile? Terry asked himself. Maybe he should go over and interrupt them, but that would just make Nikki angry, and Terry really didn't want any kind of confrontation with Alex. He watched some of the others for a while. Ricky and Trisha were dancing together again. While he watched, Ricky said something that made Trisha laugh so hard she almost fell over. David was dancing with Angela. He was a pretty good dancer, and Terry realized that he didn't really know David. He was quieter than the other jocks and didn't seem to take the competition as seriously as the rest of them did. The song ended, and another began. Nicky was still dancing with Alex. Enough is enough, Terry told himself. He started to cross the room when a musical voice stopped him. Going somewhere? Terry twisted around to see Justine standing behind a love seat. I, uh, thought I'd dance, said Terry. Isn't that a coincidence, said Justine. I was just thinking the same thing. How about dancing with me? She gave him her warmest smile, and Terry felt a knot in his stomach start to dissolve. Well, sure, he said. I'd love to. Good, said Justine. She took his hand and led him over near the fireplace. A slow tune was playing on a tape player. Terry saw Nikki whirl past with Alex, the silver prince, but she didn't see him. Up close, Terry became very aware of Justine's animal warmth and her perfume, a faint, musky scent different from anything he had smelled before. She settled even closer, pressing her body tightly against his. How are you enjoying the party? she asked huskily. It's great, he said sincerely. I think everyone is really in a party mood now. Good, said Justine. It's very important to me for all of you to enjoy yourselves. Everything's perfect, Terry said, talking to distract himself from the way he was feeling. The food, the music, the lights. You've thought of everything, you and your uncle. As a matter of fact, Uncle Philip's up in the attic now, she said, preparing a few extra surprises. How do you ever dream all this stuff up, Terry asked. We've had a long time to think about it, said Justine. But enough questions? Let's just enjoy the music and each other. She pressed even closer to him, and for a moment, Terry forgot everything except the scent and closeness of Justine. 
The tape ended and the dancers broke apart. Justine squeezed Terry's hand and went to put on a new tape. Guiltily, Terry realized that Nikki was standing by the fire, staring at him. She didn't look jealous or even angry, but there was a strange, unreadable expression on her face. Alex said something to her, and Nikki shook her head. She started to cross over to where Terry was, but stopped suddenly, her eyes wide with surprise. Everyone heard a tremendous thumping at the door, along with a growling roar from farther away. The noise was so intense that Nikki picked up the vibrations. Her mouth dropped open, and she turned toward the front of the room. Ricky pulled open the door, and the roaring became a deafening blast of sound. Then, as everyone watched in shock, two gleaming motorcycles bombed right into the living room.